The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'm Frosty Walker, Chief Information Security Officer for the Texas Education Agency. And welcome to our second in our fall series of webinars regarding cybersecurity. Today we'll be sharing where and how you can take advantage of training at no cost. We hope you find this uh, information to be informative. We will allow time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Should you have questions during the presentation, feel free to submit them and we will get them queued up for the question and answer session. If someone would, please drop me a note to let me know whether the uh, audio and visual levels are acceptable. I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The information that we will see today has been reviewed by the Data Security Advisory Committee. The DSAC is currently comprised of representatives from school districts, ESCs, TEA, and has one member in the private sector. The DSAC provides guidance to the education uh, communities, maximizing collaboration and communication regarding information security resources that can be utilized throughout the educational communities. Uh, the DSAC is diverse in both size and geographically, and they are willing to share needs, ideas, and time, hope, and provide time to, to come up with solutions for everyday cybersecurity issues that they face in the educational community. I want, to take, I want to take the time today to thank everybody that serves on that committee uh, for their time and efforts. The portal that we, we store all of this, uh, these resources at is called the Texas Gateway, HTTPS, colon slash slash www.texasgateway.org under cybersecurity tips and tools. A recording of the webinar will be posted after today's presentation. Additionally, we try to post all of the, uh, the slide presentations out there as well. If you go to that URL, you will see featured resources uh, in, the, in the lower half of the, of the web page, and you'll see cybersecurity data, cybersecurity tips and tools. When we first started the DSAC, one of the main concerns that a lot of the schools voiced was, was trying to find a place where they could, they could uh, provide good FERPA training. So we looked out uh, on the internet to see what we could find at no cost. Um, and we found a, a source from the, the U.S. Department of Education called FERPA Awareness Training. And the URL for that site is listed here. If you go to that website, you will actually see uh, their uh, uh, splash page is pretty basic, but it does have a place for you to register as a new user. Um, once you've registered as a new user, you can come back and take other courses that they provide as well. This FERPA training that, uh, that they have at this site, I thought was, uh, was good quality. It took about 35, 40 minutes to complete that training, and they do offer some additional classes. And again, there is no cost to, um, for, to take this training. At the end of that, you will get a certificate of completion. Um, you will notice, of course, there is no management. So if you wanted to say, oh, I want to require everybody in my organization to, to take this training, it doesn't offer any tools that would allow you to do that. So that would be a manual process that you would potentially have to, to uh, manage yourself. And depending on the size of your organization, that may be difficult to do. But this was good uh, FERPA training, and we wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that it's uh, out there and available.
One of the training resources that we've talked about in the past is Cybrary. And um, I have found thousands of uh, cybersecurity topics and free courses available on, on Cybrary. If you go to their URL and their website, you will see, you know, plain and a button to create a free account. Um, once you've, you've registered, then you can sign in and take as many courses as you want to. I have taken several of these courses. To the very best of my knowledge, I have never received any spam or, or any type of advertising whatsoever from, um, from them that, that's been sent out by email. So I just wanted to share that with you because I know that's always a concern when you're when you're talking about things that are at, at no cost. So today we're going to talk about some of those classes that are available out there that maybe they will pique your interest um, and encourage you to go out and, and, and take a look and see what all is uh, is available out at the cyber location. Another one of the key training that uh, is often brought up in, in the DSAC is, is good end user security awareness training. They actually offer two different courses. I have featured here the one hour course. Uh, they also have a 30 minute course. Again, there is, they, you do get a certificate of completion, but they do not offer any management of who has taken that. Um, Many of the uh, applications that, that uh, provide security awareness training, Secure the Human, Wombat, all offer that. And, and um, for educational, those are probably around, you know, less than $5 a, a headcount, probably around the range of $3 um, per uh, employee uh, that provide you managed uh, uh, resources and, and reports on who has taken it and, and who hasn't. So. If you're looking, again, if you've got a larger uh, uh, organization and, and manually uh, managing that, you may not want to take a look at it this, but depending on your size and the availability of, a, of your budget, you may want to. One of the training classes that I have on my radar that I have not taken yet, but I do plan on taking it is called uh, protection of, of information assets and um, it says it's a five-hour continued education units uh, of hours it says it's only one hour in this summary I suspect that it's longer than one hour to take but it covers it, it provides ways of, of providing assurance that your organization's policy standards procedures and controls ensure the um, a confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your information re, uh, assets. And when we look at information security, those are all key things that, uh, that, that, that we are trying to uh, establish. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability of assets. So um, I'm hoping that I have the opportunity to take this course uh, in, in the next, uh, next month and and see, see some of the ideas and, and recommendations that they make in there. Another course that they, uh, they feature that uh, is called Fundamental Vulnerability Management. Uh, vulnerability Management is the continuous information security risk process that requires management oversight. And they have a four-tier approach. Um, I took this class a couple of years ago. I want to go back and take this class again. When we talk about vulnerabilities, um, you know, vulnerability program uh, includes your, your, uh, uh, your OS patch management, for example, the monthly patches that you do for your workstations and, and, and Microsoft uh, servers. It also includes um, uh, patches and, and, and updates on your applications, um, your, your, your applications themselves, as well as the code that is used to, to, to run those applications. So 
There are actually tools that, that scan for vulnerabilities and then you, you know, they're rated in critical and high and, and medium, low. Um, so this talks about uh, how you can manage the oversight of, of all the vulnerability management program. And I think this is a, a very good course. Another course that's available out there is called End User Network Security. And when we talk about network security, we're talking about the process of taking physical and software preventive measures to protect the underlying networking infrastructure. When we talk about network infrastructure, we're talking about firewalls, routers, switches, those things that you typically have locked in a closet. Uh, and there's a reason why they're locked in a closet, because if something happens to one of those uh, devices, you may lose your entire network. Um, I'm reminded a couple of years ago here in Central Texas where we had had a, um, uh, a scam where, where people would show up in a truck that said networking security company on it. They would go to the office and say, I'm here to change out your networking equipment. Someone would let them into the, um, in, into the room. They would say, I'm taking your old ones out, putting them in the truck. I'm going to bring your new ones back. And they never came back. They were stealing network infrastructure. And that uh, organization was actually caught and, and prosecuted. So, you know, some of the, the basic things that, uh, that, that we need to, to, to follow, such as making sure that, that, that those uh, infrastructure is protected under physically under lock and key, but also that there's a process if someone is there to work on it. Who do we notify? How do we determine that that's a legitimate uh, company that's here to work on uh, work on our infrastructure? And some of those details are covered in uh, in this training. Many of y'all may take uh, credit cards uh, as, as part of your program at, at your school, whether that's for school lunches or different things that you provide as services. The payment card industry data security standard, PCI slash DSS, is a standard by the credit card company or the payment card company that has certain requirements of how you handle um, uh, credit card information. So if you're not aware of uh, these types of standards and you are accepting credit cards, there are different types of conditions that you, you may need to be adhering to. Um, for example, uh, if you're accepting credit cards uh, and, and you're doing, uh, and there's a limit on how much volume you're doing, um, you may need to be filing uh, a quarterly attestation that you have scanned all of your publicly facing IP ranges and that using a um, approved vendor um, to, to provide those services and you submit that attestation and it, it says that you have remediated all of the, your, your vulnerabilities that are above say a medium uh, level. Um, there are if you use a third party to process your credit cards, there's a different process that you, you may need to, to be following. So um, yeah, you may want to take a, take a look at this course just to see if you, uh, if, if you need to be in compliance. And it also provides good standard uh, information security practices. There's a course that, the, that talks about protecting data in transit. And um, when we talk about data in transit um, and protecting that, so we're talking about multiple ways that it's transmitted. But primarily, let's first talk, I'll talk about from the, the, the end user browser. So they're logging into your, your website and talking to some type of an application server. And that communication can be encrypted. 
Uh, we typically see that through HTTPS, the use of what's called um, uh, the secure socket layer. Um, that means that, 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 that your browser has actually negotiated with the application server to use some type of encryption process so that that data is not being transmitted in the raw. Uh, and we see that, for example, if you, you log on to your bank, you will see a lock in your browser that is locked. And if it's, and if you go to a website that that in, data is not encrypted, you will see a lock that is unlocked. So that's an easy way to tell whether the data is being encrypted from the browser, the end user, to the application server. But there's also other places. Now your application server is also talking poti potentially back to other servers that's on your network, bringing that information up to the application server that can then provide that out to the end user. And how do we protect that data in transit as well? And there are ways to protect that data uh, behind the application server. So, so this class talks about some of the basics of uh, data flows uh, and, and how to protect that, that data in transit. Here's a course that's uh, eight hours. Um, You may think this may be getting a little bit uh, sophisticated or complicated, but in this case, this is a course about incident response, and it, call, it, it, it identifies advanced forensics. And with this course, you will indeed find an introduction to inter, uh, incident response, and, and you'll learn how to develop three important protection plans, and you'll also learn on how to perform some advanced forensics on an incident. I have not taken this class, but I do want to take this class because I want to see what level that, that advanced forensics is actually at. But again, it, it offers three ways to develop uh, important uh, protection plans in case of an incident response. Um, and it's going to teach you some type of, of, of basic uh, forensics training. There's also a course out there for uh, penetration testing and, testing and uh, ethical hacking. Um, penetration testing. Some people say, well, what is penetration testing? Here at TEA, we actually pay someone once a year to try to break into our systems and penetrate them uh, using tools and, and methods that um, that, that they've learned uh, through, through, through experience, and, and there are a lot of applications out there for this type of work. So this uh, penetrating testing identifies vulnerabilities that may be, be on, on your applications, and then it actually tries to exploit those and extract potential sensitive information or some type of information from within those systems. Um, this, again, is, is a training that, that, that will teach you how that type of work is done, but it also gives you a better understanding of how to prevent someone from exploiting those vulnerabilities. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and this course also talks about you know, how to exploit networks in the manner of a hacker. Well, um, again, if you're learning how to do those things, uh, then you're, you, you better have a better understanding of how to protect against those things. Should you want to do penetration testing or ethical hacking, be sure that you have a written um, permission from, from your agency or from, from your, your, your school leadership and that they've agreed to that. Uh, otherwise, uh, sometimes uh, people think that you're, you're doing that uh, unethically and, and you can be potentially prosecuted for that. So if you do that, be sure that you have it in writing that, that uh, it's okay for you to perform those functions. But understanding how that's done 
gives you a better understanding of how to protect your, your assets. You say, well, that gets a little bit too detailed for what I'm, I'm really interested in some of the training that I think that, that some of my, my folks in, in the schools uh, may need. So there are, there are uh, training courses out there available. Here's, here's one for a Microsoft Certified System Analyst. Uh, there is a course that you can take through Microsoft and then you can get that certification. But in this class, you're, you're going to learn about Microsoft um, uh, Office Suites. You're going to learn about uh, how, how to map network drives, how to set up printers, uh, how to configure uh, PCs. So there's a lot of education about PCs and configuration and how to set those up. So if you have somebody new on your team that is not very knowledgeable on that, this may be um, uh, a way that, that they can gain that, that knowledge. They also offer a course about IT governance and management. Um, this actually talks about, about what, what you need to do surrounding governance or how you manage or how you govern your, your, uh, your IT functions. Uh, this is typically considered a broader overlaying uh, layer of, uh, of how your IT uh, uh, department is run. But again, this gives you some basic concepts of how governance and management of IT resources should be, uh, uh, should be handled. also offer one on cybersecurity management. Of course, that's one of the things that we talk about the, the, the most in these, uh, in these presentations. In this particular training, it is a one-hour course. It talks about cyber risk. It talks about legal considerations. It talks about insurance and why some businesses, it may make good sense to use insurance and, um, and, and where that is a... Um, where that's a good fit. I know that, that many of the schools actually you use data breach insurance and uh, and I think that's 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 a good thing. Um, the one thing that I would recommend that you do is that you if you are doing insurance you need to pull up the contracts for that insurance and look and see what what services they're actually going to provide if there is a data breach and if that's going to meet your expectations of what they're going to provide. Uh, a lot of times uh, contracts may vary differently than what your expectations of the services that are actually going to be provided. So I recommend that on any type of contract, whether that's insurance or whether that's a contract for cloud, uh, cloud computing uh, or, or somebody providing, uh, building an application for you, you, you need to take the time to review those contracts and see what they're actually going to provide for you. One of the most difficult things that, 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 that I think is uh, that we deal with uh, in our environment today are mobile devices. Um, we, we allow employees to bring personal devices uh, that can be used on our wide area network. I'll give you an example. We actually divide our, our wireless network into three different segments. Uh, we have uh, a network for uh, agency-owned devices in which they actually authenticate against our Active Directory or LDAP and they actually then uh, have access to the same resources that I would have on my, uh, on, on my desktop. Um, you can also bring in uh, a personal device and if you log in um, on a personal device and you use your TEA um, email and address, it will, on a personal device, the network puts you in a, in a a sandbox that provides internet connectivity, 
but the advantage of, of that is that, that it allows you to stay connected for 30 days before you have to re-authenticate. If you log in and you're a guest and you use an, uh, an, an email address that is not a TEA email address, then you would be required to authenticate on a daily every time you come into the building and, and, um, and access that, that network. So those are just some of the, the things that need to be considered about uh, mobile devices and, and, and what they're accessing and how they access. And then you, you know, if people are using their personal phones for, um, uh, for email, are you, you know, do you, do you need to have that container, their personal device containerized where you can put that, that email in that container? And should somebody lose um, uh, control or uh, lose that phone, that you can wipe that container so that if someone were to indeed input a, a, a proper code to, to get into their phone, that you would not have exposure of potentially sensitive information that was in email. So those are some of the things that, that, that have to be addressed on how you want to handle mobile security. And so there are some of those concepts that are talked about in this type of training. Cryptography fundamentals. We're talking about Encryption and decryption. Um, there, are, we talk about about if something is encrypted, then you also need to be able to unencrypt or decrypt that. And so this class is just basically about the fundamentals of encryption. You know, encryption goes back to Egyptian era, where they often use runners uh, in battle. To, uh, to, to, to provide information of what they're going to do. And they encrypted their, um, uh, the messages so that if the runner was, was captured, then, then their enemy would not know what, they were, what their plans were. So encryption has is, is, is been around for, for you know, thousand years almost and uh, we still use that today so that the data is is protected if it's uh, if it's at rest or if it's in transit so this is a course that's just talking about the fundamentals of uh, cryptology another hot topic that we uh, we see all the time is uh, um, cloud computing and how I can utilize cloud computing for what we need to do. And this course addresses some of the uh, essential knowledge of implementing, managing, and maintaining cloud technologies as securely as possible. And that depends, again, on what type of data you're putting in the cloud. Uh, if you're putting out just public information, then you may not need to, to make sure that, 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 that you have all the security um, that, that, that you would, would put around sensitive information. But you would still want to have the capability of restoring that data, and that's an advantage that you have in the cloud. Oftentimes, if, if something happens to, the, to a website that's public information, you can quickly spin up an, a new uh, virtual machine and restore the last backup of that public information, and the website be back up and available or there are services that they can provide that you have a, a, a hot staff, uh, a, a hot uh, uh, backup that, that are synchronized, um, depending on what level of uh, backup and recovery you need, need to provide for those applications. If you're looking at providing sensitive information in, in the cloud, then we need to take a few extra steps to make sure that, that we're providing the same type of security in the cloud that we would if the, the data was, was sitting in, in our data center. So this is a very good class about basic fundamentals of um, how to implement and manage uh, uh, cloud technologies securely. Access control and identity management, uh, IAM. Uh, the, 
security and business diplomat, uh, uh, discipline that enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right times. Boy, that sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, it's not necessarily quite that easy. You know? So you should have processes in place about onboarding process. That process may be fairly simple. You know, you could say, hey, I'm bringing on a, a new em employee and I, I want them to have the same access rights as Frosty does. And so they can set that up. You know, um, your, your computer access folks, uh, your administrator can go out and, and easily clone what, what I have or what someone has with that. But you also should have a, uh, an offboarding process that removes all of those, uh, those, those privileges and access. And then what happens if somebody moves from one division, for example, let's say I move from security to go to the legal department. Do I need the same access in the legal department that I have in security? And the answer to that's no, I don't. So you should have a process that, that provides you know, the capability for the right individuals to have the right access at the right times. And, you know, that may mean that you have to disable all the activities that they previously had and re, um, re-establish what they have now. There's different processes that you can do with that. But this gives you a basic idea of identity uh, access and management. This is a good, this is a good class. And there's a class out there that talks about business continuity and disaster recovery planning. And considering what uh, Texas has been through in the last uh, six weeks, we have a little better understanding about disaster. Um, and hopefully we have learned a lot uh, about disaster recovery planning, uh, which primarily focuses on IT systems whereas business continuity focuses on you being able to continue your business. Um, and disaster recovery plans typically have to do with we've had a disaster at our data center. Um, and it's going to take six months or a year to restore those. So we have a disaster recovery plan where we take our backups and we build out, we, we build out a new data center and we have to prioritize what, um, what we, uh, we feel like is the most important uh, applications to bring up first. So, you know, when there's a disaster, that's not the time to be, uh, be trying to figure that out. There should be a plan and how you're going to bring up those, and what impacts the, uh, the business the most, and have priorities already established. The same thing is true with business continuity planning. Uh, that business continuity planning uh, focuses on so many pieces of the business. Um, here last week at TEA, we are housed at, a, at the Travis building in the uh, Capitol complex. And for a week, the top four floors of this building was without power. And we're on the fourth floor. But the agencies that were on the top four four floors did not have power in the building, in their building for four, for five days. So what is our business, what is their business con uh, continuity plan to have those workers either work remotely or what, how, do you have the capacity for those people to, to work remotely? Um, you know, we're, we're certainly not expecting to have a power outage that, that, that lasts all week uh, at a state building. As it turned out, uh, they they had broken uh, a part while they were up, uh, a, a part while they were doing an upgrade, and they had to have a manufacturer fabricate the piece that was broken. So you just never know about business continuity. Uh, the same thing is true we saw in Houston, where uh, power to buildings was in the basements that were that were flooded. So suddenly, how, how do your employees work? Uh, how, how do you get them to perform their duties and, and their functions? So that's what business continuity tries to address, is, 
is all of those different things that could potentially impact your business continuity. Again, this is a, this is a nice course that talks about about disaster recovery and business continuity and, uh, and, and how you go about planning for, for those types of uh, uh, disasters and uh, um, issues that come up. The last thing I'm going to talk about that's out on Cybrary is actually what a, an information security officer does. And I have taken this training. And I thought it was good training. It gives it gave me uh, some extra ideas, things that I need to be looking at uh, as a uh, as the chief information security officer for for the Texas Education Agency. So if you you want to look at uh, some training that 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 offers a lot of different basic ideas of of what you should be looking at in your information security program, I would highly recommend this uh, this this training. So that was the last course that I was going to highlight off of Cyberry, but as I said, there are literally thousands of um, uh, cybersecurity and information security training. It has a lot of other training as well out there um, that, that is, uh, you know, at no cost. Um, but I also wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about the things that we, we have already discussed at um, at our portal uh, under cybersecurity tips and tools, because those are also training uh, tools and assets. We use these webinars that hopefully will help you do a, a better job in protecting the resources that the citizens of Texas have shared with all of us. So at our uh, cybersecurity tips and tools folder under the texasgateway.org, you know, we have educational risk assessments. We have a cybersecurity framework summary with the 40 controls that we, we uh, often talk about. We do have the link for the library. We have questions to consider uh, for um, uh, cloud providers. If you're looking at doing business with cloud providers, there are, there's a group of 10, 10 or 12 questions that, that uh, I use every time we're, we're looking at providing services for those. Uh, there is an incident response handling red book. There are incident, uh, incident response exercises that you can do as tabletop. And of course, they, all of the webinars that we presented so far are, are recorded and available at that, uh, at that website. I also want to remind everybody that we have one more uh, webinar session in our fall series. That's coming up uh, November the 8th, again at 1 o'clock. Uh, that, that has to do with guidelines on cybersecurity documentation. So there are some templates that we're going to share out there uh, regarding policies, uh, regarding strategic planning, tactical planning, operational planning. Those are, those are, are terms that, that are used to describe long-term planning, mid-term planning, and, and uh, short-term planning uh, to provide a common framework um, to, to achieve your organizational goals. So I uh, just want to remind everybody that that is coming up. Uh, you can register at this link that, that appears on this, uh, the screen. We will post this webinar at the uh, end of the presentation today. But if for any reason you, uh, you can't find that information, drop me an email and I'll be more than glad to uh, send the registration link for you. Uh, are there any questions today? And I will remind those folks that, were, that joined us last month, we had a lot of questions that uh, we were not able to answer. Uh, a lot of them had to do with FERPA and had to do with uh, HIPAA uh, compliance. And uh, we have posted answers out on the, uh, the portal for that. We had our, uh, our uh, privacy officer here at uh, the Texas Education Agency review those questions. And, and answer those so we're providing a, a solid good information for that um, so if you were looking for an answer to a question uh, you can go out to the portal and find those uh, uh, questions and answers from our last session
And so far, I'm not showing any questions today. Um, again, you know, we were talking about you know, there, there are always hidden costs in, in training, the time that's spent, potentially the, the, the managerial time if you're trying to manage that for a group of people. But you know, you're not necessarily uh, paying for, for that training. Um, yes, uh, we had a question come in about uh, the, the sessions are recorded. All of the webinars are um, recorded and put out on the uh, uh, cybersecurity tips and tools at the uh, Texas Gateway. Um, so uh, we'll try to get this published out there by tomorrow. Uh, just depends on, on who, uh, you know, if we can get that out there. Uh, the URL, I'll show that on the screen again. I'll have to back up here, pardon me. It's this URL, https slash slash www.texasgateway, all one word, dot org. And there's a, there's a uh, featured resources. And you will find cybersecurity and cybersecurity tips and tools under featured resources. If you click on that, it will, will bring you to uh, to all the resources that we've published out there for uh, for the educational community. All right, I don't have any other questions coming up right now. So uh, if that is the case, we're going to give you all back some time today. Uh, but anytime, oh, here's here's a question: free encryption software. Um, there is free encryption software. Um, Olga, I will send you, uh, and I'll post that uh, software um, on, online where you can find that. Um, there are two or three tools out there that that allow you to in, encrypt. Such things as, as USB drives, volume drives, lets you encrypt by file. So it just depends on, um, oh, and, and over your specifically email. Um, if you're doing email in Office 365, there is a option uh, that allows you to uh, send that confidentially. It uses the term confidential but it encrypts that uh, from end to end. And it doesn't have to just be someone, both end users do not have to be using Office 365 to send uh, that, uh, that information. There are other tools that, that you can use to encrypt uh, uh, email as well. I will, uh, I will take that under, um, under research and I will post uh, uh, some of the things that, that we can provide for that. So I appreciate uh, that. That was a very good point. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions today? And as always, don't hesitate to, um, to drop me a, um, a question in, at my email address. Um, that is frosty.walker at tea.texas.gov. Uh, you can call me on my, my business phone, 512-463-5095. Any of those ways, I'll be glad to work with, uh, with anyone to uh, uh, try to resolve any issues that, uh, that, that we can. If you have a specific uh, uh, issue that you're trying to address, drop, drop me a note. I can take that to our DSAC committee, and we'll see if we can't find some, some ways to, to resolve it. Uh, that's what we're trying to provide, is make it a little easier on everybody so they're not thinking that they're an island and they've got to figure out how to do this all by themselves. So with that, I will, uh, I'm will. i going to give you back some time today. It looks like we're going to give you back about 15 minutes. So uh, I appreciate everybody attending today, and uh, 